Hey guys, um, so tonight the topic we're going over is going to be urinary disorders, um, but specifically what we're going to be working on are practice questions. Um, so I've created some original practice questions that um, hopefully should bring together some content. So one point of doing these practice questions is to look at the content and try to bring together some situations these patients may be in. Um, the other point of this PowerPoint and this presentation is um, to really start learning some of that test taking strategy and seeing how we can um, apply these concepts regardless of the questions you get to multiple questions. So let's start with our first practice question. You can read it and I'm going to read it out loud as well just to give you time to read the question. So it says the nurse is caring for a client with recurring cystitis. Which intervention will be most effective to help relieve the symptoms associated with this problem? So what most students do is they're going to read the question, they're going to read all the choices and then start panicking. So what I recommend doing is before you even get into the answer choices, because especially because these are practice questions, this isn't on the exam and it's good to practice, practice, I can talk, practice, um, you know, uh, reading questions and really understanding what they're asking you. Um, so this question saying the nurse is caring for a client with recurring cystitis. So first and foremost, I have to know what cystitis is. Um, and cystitis is another word for a urinary tract infection, a bladder infection. Um, but you, you tell me you see that word cyst, you should think about the bladder. Um, so inflammation of the bladder is also um, known as like a urinary tract infection and saying it's recurring. So they have it on a regular basis. And then the question is asking me which intervention will be most effective to help relieve the symptoms associated with this problem. Anytime you see a question that says what will be most effective means that all of the answer choices could be correct, but what's going to be most helpful. And, you know, these questions are hard because a lot of times, you, you know, you're kind of going back to what you heard your professor say. Um, and sometimes that's going to be the right answer, but sometimes, um, you know, you have to really think about what's going to be most direct or most helpful overall for this problem. So really this question, if you had to reword it for yourself, you could be asking yourself um, what's going to help to prevent uh, sorry, not prevent, what's going to help to, uh, what's going to help with symptoms of a UTI. And so you always have to look also what the question's asking you. So it doesn't say which intervention will be most effective to treat this problem. It says to relieve the symptoms. Um, so in other words, um, I have to always know what the inflection of the question is, what it's specifically asking about. So to kind of sum up, you know, when you're reading this question, you want to know, okay, what's the problem? What disease process are we talking about? Um, am I looking for an answer that is the only true answer? Or is it possible that there's more than one right answer? And then what specific direct thing am I trying to find an answer for? And so for this one, I'm trying to find the best way to help relieve symptoms of a UTI. So my first answer choice is encourage client to void at least every two to three hours. So, I mean, that sounds pretty good. Like, I mean, I definitely want them to go to the bathroom um, every few hours. And that sounds like something really good to help to prevent a UTI in general. But I don't know if it's really going to help the symptoms, but I'm going to keep going. It says encourage client to drink at least two liters of fluid daily. Again, probably something really good, but it doesn't really seem to be answering the question. And the cool thing here too, is once I've gotten two answer choices that are pretty similar, like um, if the question really was like, hey, what's most effective to help with UTIs? Um, both A and B are correct, like, or the same, like they're the same thing. They're both measuring the same thing. So anytime you're doing a question um, and you see two answers that are very similar, and I don't mean that they're saying the exact same thing, but they're both solving the same problem, um, they both can't be correct. So I can already kind of cross out A and B, but let's keep going. And it says, um, position the client with head of bed at least 30 to 45 degrees. Now, this is the first one that I'm like, hey, I'm not really sure about this. This doesn't really sound like it's going to be helpful, but I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt. And, um, you know, I'm going to keep going because I don't know. I have to see what my other answer choice is. Um, and this is something else good to kind of know is like when we pick distractors and stuff for nursing school exams, um, you know, we're always looking for um, questions and, uh, or sorry, um, sorry, uh, answer choices. Like usually we want answers that are correct for like a similar disease process. We want ones that are generally good things to do and like keeping the head of the bed 30, 45 degrees. And that's a general intervention that's kind of in y'all's head. That's like, hey, I should do this regularly with a lot of patients. So sometimes students will choose this answer just because they're like, hey, I hear that a lot. But is it applicable for this patient in this situation, what it's asking for? Um, so then my last choice is apply heating bat, 
pad to the client's suprapubic area. So let's just say I don't even know, um, you know, what a suprapubic area is. Um, and so um, you know, even if I'm just looking at these answer choices, just face value, um, which of them actually helps with a symptom, you know, telling them to avoid every so many hours, drink fluids, keep their head of the bed elevated, like none of those really seem to have anything to do with helping with pain around my urinary tract. Um, so, um, you know, D is already kind of standing out as a good answer to me. And it is the correct answer, by the way, if you chose D, you got it right. Woo. Um, but, um, you know, it, it, this is some of that process of elimination. Uh, I, I don't like students to just go over strategy and just know strategy for um, test questions. But sometimes strategy can really save you in those moments where there's just so much content and there's not enough time. So for this one, for which intervention will be most effective to help with the symptoms of a UTI, um, D is the best answer. So applying that heating pad um, to the suprapubic area, which is the area, um, what do you call it, in the lower abdomen in the front where they're going to have a lot of that burning. Because remember, where is the bladder located? It's located in the suprapubic area. So let's look at this next question. It says, a client is found to have a calcium oxalate kidney stone. Which directions by the nurse will be most helpful to prevent further calcium oxalate stones? So um, I found that they've had a kidney stone. I'm reading the question. It says, which directions by the nurse will be most helpful? So here we go again. Another question that might have multiple right answers, but which one is going to be the most helpful or most direct? So I see increased physical activity. And if I knew a lot about kidney stones, I would remember, hey, I think that's something I want to do when they have a kidney stone to help pass it. But I don't know if it's going to actually help prevent further stones. Um, you know, I'm not sure. I don't remember exercise being a um, preventative for kidney stones. Um, is it something that's generally good to do in life? Sure. But is it going to help me stop making so, uh, so many calcium oxalate stones? I don't know. Let's keep going. So decrease calcium intake. All right, this sounds like a good one because calcium is in the question. So this is, seems like kind of a gimme. But then, you know, of course, if you're a nursing student, you're probably saying to yourself, this is too easy. <laughs> like, you know, or uh, what do you call it? Like, it can't be that easy. So what do you call it? So I'm going to keep it on the back burner and we'll see what happens. Uh, maintain a low sodium diet. Hmm. I'm not sure. That sounds like something cardiac related. But I think I remember something my professor said about calcium and sodium or calcium oxalate stones and sodium. So I'm going to keep that one, you know, in my repertoire as well. And then the last one, increase fluid intake to two liters daily. So um, that seems like a good answer, but this kind of goes back to that last question, that strategy I told you guys is that this sounds like something really good generally to do for kidney stones, but is it specific for calcium oxalate stones? And this is where a lot of students um, get caught is, is that um, they pick an answer choice that's generally a good thing to do, but it doesn't directly answer the question. So this is not saying how to, what's going to help prevent kidney stones. It's going to, what's going to help to prevent specifically further calcium oxalate stones, because that's pretty much my job in kidney stones as the nurse is we want to um, strain all urine, collect that stone, figure out what kind of stone it is. And then once we figure out what kind of stone it is, we want to prevent further of those stones happening. Um, and so um, another strategy that you can use here, let's say that we're going to cross out A and D is looking at that both B and C are talking about some dietary changes. Um, and so since they're similar, sometimes ones that are kind of similar, but a little different, um, you know, that, that a lot of times they can be the right answer. Uh, one of those is going to be the right answer um, because um, you know we're putting things that are similar and seeing if you can differentiate um, the subtle things. So now I'm down to B and C and this is where all students hate to be because they get in this like thing in their head where they're looking at both answers and they're like what do I do? Um, so let's say that I don't have the knowledge um, to do this. If you're down to this and you really don't have the knowledge, um, what do you call it? Um, you have to just use your best judgment and really think about what's going to be most helpful. Um, and maybe you can like, you know, again, some people may choose B or some may choose C um, when it comes down to it. But sometimes when it comes down to it, if you don't have the knowledge, don't waste a lot of time painstaking. And, you know, you can go back and look at the question again. But if it really comes down to, I don't know if I need less sodium or less um, or less calcium, um, you know, then you just have to kind of pick the... <laughs> <laughs> whatever one is, you know, your heart or your brain is telling you to go to um, and then stick with it. Don't change your answer and move on. Um, but, you know, if I did have some knowledge of kidney stones, I would remember that, you know, my professor Woodruff maybe said, <laughs> you know, that uh, um, calcium oxalate stones are not about um, not uh, we cut um, having too much calcium. They're actually about um, either having too much oxalate um, or too much sodium. So C is the correct answer here that I want them to maintain a low sodium sodium diet. It's that thing that I said does not make sense, but effectively if I have high sodium, I start depositing and storing more calcium and making
making those stones. So um, in other words, I, I hold on um, and um, start um, you know, like getting those um, calcium oxalate stones, the more sodium that I have. So the correct answer here is going to be C. Oh, select all that apply, you guys' favorite. So this one says, a nurse is taking a health history for a client with a suspected urinary tract infection, which statements, if made by the client, would increase their risk for urinary tract infection. Um, select all that apply. So this is a risk factor question and a SATA. So this is saying, you know, like, um, I'm going to be evaluating what the client is going to say that's going to make me think, like, ding, 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 they could be at risk for UTI. So pretty much we're looking at which of these indicates risk factors for UTI. Now, most select all that apply questions are going to be knowledge questions, but sometimes they can get more application level. So you got to be a little careful and <laughs> definitely want to read carefully. Um, so uh, answer choice A. And by the way, with these, I always like to go start at the top, make my way down and just say true or false. I can like leave one and say, well, I'm going to go back, but I don't like to play that game too much because if I play that game too much, I'm going to end up being like, oh, well, I only have two. I need at least three or what should I have, et cetera, et cetera. So um, you should never play any games when it comes to status. It's just true or false straight down. So A says, I wipe from front to back after urination. Why? Well, I think that sounds pretty good. So um, I'm gonna like, remember we're seeing what's gonna increase the risk. So that's gonna be false. So that sounds like a good thing. I want them to wipe from front to back. Um, the second one says I void two times daily in the morning and the evening. Hmm, two times daily, that doesn't seem very often. So then I have to go back and think about what did I learn about urinary tract infections? And one of the things we talked about is, is that urinary retention or holding onto urine for um, longer periods of time is not healthy. Like we always think about nurses, things like that, that might be holding onto their urine. Um, so avoiding two times a daily, just in the morning and the evening sounds really not good and increase the risk. So I'm gonna say true for that one or that one's gonna increase the risk. Um, my most recent hemoglobin A1C was 10.9%. Oh man, a lot of these professors got to bring up previous topics. That's so mean. <laughs> so we love to do this, don't we? Um, and so um, if I remember diabetes, which hopefully <laughs> by this point in the semester, you remember something about diabetes. Um, hemoglobin A1C, we really like it like five to six-ish. Um, and so... Um, uh, what do you call it? 10.9 is high. So what does that tell me? So pretty much what this is at, this answer choice is asking is having, um, you know, hyperglycemia, diabetes, um, put me at higher risk for UTIs. And if I remember anything about diabetes, I remember that diabetics are more at risk for infection and have less mobilization of their immune defense. So therefore, um, I'm going to say yes, that that does increase their risk for uh, urinary tract infection. Um, then um, answer choice D, I like to take bubble baths two to three times per week. Hmm. So uh, I do remember my professor saying something about like scents and fragrances or kind of putting anything that's going to change my pH um, can increase my risk for UTI. So I'm going to go with yes for this. And it is, it is true. Taking bubble baths does put you at risk. It's not about the bath. It's about the fragrant, the fragrance. I can talk fragrance <laughs> and uh, uh, pretty much the, uh, it can change the pH. And so it's really about the chemicals versus the bath itself. Because a lot of people think, oh yeah, taking a bath, that's, you're just sitting in your own filth, it's nasty. Um, but taking baths doesn't necessarily put you at more risk for UTIs, but definitely taking bubble baths or using any fragrances, scented perfumes and stuff um, down in your hoo-ha is uh, going to increase your risk for UTIs. So um, then E says, I have regular bowel movements daily. Um, so, um, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm like, okay, well, what does the bowel have to do with the bladder? So I might be like, kind of like sitting there, it's like, well, is it good that they're pooping every day or is it going to increase their risk? And the, the, the answer here is that, um, this is actually a good thing. So it's kind of like the A, I wipe from front to back after urination. Um, having regular bowel movements, it's good for bladder health. So um, if I'm looking at this one, you know, and I'm just kind of sitting there, I'm like, hmm, I have regular bowel movements. What do you call it? I'm kind of even just look in the name, like having regular bowel movements, that's usually probably a healthy thing um, as a whole. Um, but, um, you know, we always have to consider, you know, the possibility and the whole reason, if you don't remember about the connection between bowel and bladder is going to be that, um, remember if I have a bunch of like, if I'm constipated, I have a bunch of stool in my rectum and it's just sitting there. Um, the most common bacteria that causes UTIs is E. coli. And sometimes it's that, st the bacteria from that stool is sitting there and it travels and migrates right into my urinary tract. So having regular bowel movements is good. It's good to get that crap out literally, um, in order to help to, uh, decrease the risk of infection. It says my most recent BMI was 32. 
So, hmm, um, you know, sit here at first, I have to know what a normal BMI is. And we like um, normal is going to be like less than 25. Um, and so, um, and then obese is like above 30. So this patient is obese. Um, and so we're going to have to think, okay, is obesity a risk factor for UTI? And I'm going to say yes, because uh, what do you call it? Um, if you have more weight on you, then you're going to be more likely to have weaker muscles, which may not close as well, which might increase my risk of UTI. So the correct answer here, excuse me, one sec. <clears throat> the correct answers here are um, correct that they would increase the risk for UTIs are B, C, D, and F. Now, um, doing a question, like a select all apply when we're talking about strategy here, it's good to go from top to bottom, just true, false and make our way down. But you can see how some of these are tricky because they're not just directly saying like having, I have diabetes, like we have to be able to interpret the other data there. Um, but it's really key that, um, you know, that's why uh, bringing together content, sometimes you have to really know what the question or the answer is telling you. So let's look at number four. A client is being discharged with stress incontinence. Which statement by the client indicates more teaching is necessary? A, I will, oh, you know, hold on a sec, let's go back to the question. I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing the typical nursing student thing and rushing into the answers. So um, they're being discharged with stress incontinence, which means that I'm probably teaching them or getting them ready to go home. So I need to think about what I need to um, do to prepare them to go home. Um, so it says, which statement by the client indicates more teaching is necessary? So I'm looking for what is wrong. And this is where a lot of students, they rush right in and like, I almost did the same thing. You can see how easy it is to do it. Um, is I rush, I almost rushed right in to see like, oh my goodness, like, you know, um, let me, let me find what the right answer is, but I'm looking for what's wrong. And you, oh, anytime there's a teaching question, you want to know, am I looking for the right answer or the wrong answer? So first answer, I will try to lose some weight to improve my stress incontinence. Um, so, I mean, weight loss in general is usually a good thing. And if I'm thinking stress incontinence, I mean, even if I didn't know that much, maybe thinking like, hey, weight is pressure. And if stress incontinence sounds like something that's related to pressure, then it sounds like maybe something that I would want them to do. So I'm going to go to the next one. I will regularly do pelvic floor exercises to improve my stress incontinence. Hmm. So I know my teacher said a whole bunch of stuff about kegels and um, really, um, you know, uh, strengthening muscles. And if the problem is that I have a weak muscle with stress incontinence, Pelvic floor exercises are probably good. Um, says, I will go to the bathroom every two hours to improve my stress, stress incontinence. Hmm, maybe that might help if they go to the bathroom more, they might you know, be less incontinent. That sounds like pretty good, but we'll see. Uh, what's the last one? I will quit smoking cigarettes to improve my stress incontinence. Hmm. I don't know if the cigarettes are related to the urinary tract, but cigarettes seem to be bad for everything. So um, usually, I, I don't know if I've ever seen a, a question where cigarettes was not a bad thing. <laughs> um, so that, I mean, that sounds like something I would want them to do. So that leaves me with C. So maybe by process of elimination, I end up at C. But if we really are thinking test taking strategy here, and um, we have to think about stress incontinence. And this is where like, if you get an incontinence question, you always have to want to know what is the type of incontinence, what's actually going to help. And so the goal in when we're talking about incontinence is to be continent. So like, I mean, uh, like, even though I can tell them to do stuff like, hey, wear a pad and just catch, you you know, when you pee, when you cough, when you pee, sorry, sorry, when you pee, when you cough, there we go. When you pee, when you cough, um, we cut, um, you know, you could just catch it, you know, in like a, um, uh, like with a pad or a diaper or something like that, that doesn't really help them to be functional. You're like, yes, if they're peeing on themselves, I don't want their skin to break down. So it, it helps with their skin breakdown. But if my goal is continence, um, I want to do things that are going to help me to be more continent. So if I lose weight, I have, um, I can, um, have less pressure, which is gonna make me less likely to have that stress incontinence. If I, I do the strengthening exercises, the kegels, that's gonna actually help the problem, which is that I have weak muscles. If I quit smoking cigarettes, that's going to help with blood flow. And that's also going to help, uh, what do you call it? Um, smoke, uh, cigarettes are a, you know, an irritant for everything, including my bladder. So if I have less bladder irritation, I'm gonna have a stronger bladder, which is going to decrease my stress incontinence. But you have to think about it. If I just take them to the bathroom every two hours, is it going to stop them from um, peeing every time they cough? It's not. Because I mean, I could, the thing with stress incontinence is I can take them to the bathroom all the time. I could take them every 30 minutes and it's not going to change the fact that they have a weak muscle. So it's not a functional problem where they're just like, hey, I can't get to the bathroom in time or something like that. The problem is not that they um, you know, are not getting to the bathroom in time. The problem is they have a weak muscle and because that weak muscle, um, they, uh, they are unable to... Um, uh, you know, have continence or maintain their continence. Practice question five. 
a nurse is caring for a client with a urinary catheter, which intervention by the nurse is appropriate for this client? So this kind of question, um, this is not a, like we know so far we've done a lot of questions, which is most appropriate or most helpful or best. This is just saying, hey, a patient has a catheter, what is appropriate? So this is like, think of this like a true or false. Like I'm just going down and trying to figure out true or false. Are these correct? So um, A says, clamp the ca catheter once a shift to assess for bladder function. Hmm. I don't remember hearing my professor say anything about clamping the catheter. So I'm gonna keep going on. I don't really like that one as a whole. Um, it says regularly, uh, B says regularly assess indication and need for Foley catheter daily. Well, I do remember that as a whole, I want them to um, get that catheter out as soon as possible. So maybe this is possible. Maybe this is something that we might wanna do. Um, then C says assess bowel sounds every shift for complications of urinary catheter. Hmm. I'm not sure what the bowel sounds would have to do with complications of a urinary catheter. Um, it doesn't really sound like something directly related, um, but, you know, assessing bowel sounds sounds serious, right? So this is where some students might be like, hmm, I don't think that's the right thing. Um, I, I, if I remember stuff about complications of urinary catheter, everything's around infection and stuff like that, not necessarily anything with the bowels. Um, and it says, D, maintain the catheter at bladder level for adequate drainage. Well, if I remember my professor correctly, she said, uh, what do you call it to, um, you know, make sure to keep it below the level of the bladder for adequate drainage. So this is like a tricky thing we'll do sometimes that we put something that's pretty close to the answer, but we change just a little part of it uh, to make it incorrect. So remember, this is one of those good times that the whole answer has to be correct in order for this answer choice to be right. Um, so that leaves me with A and B. And then when I'm looking at it, you know, I really have to think about what's going to be appropriate for this client. And I can't imagine having to clamp that every shift. So I'm going to go with B. And B is the correct answer. Isn't it funny how I get the, all of these answers correctly? It's just wonderful, right? It's almost like I wrote these questions. Um, so um, B is the correct answer. So with a patient with a catheter, um, we do not clamp it. Um, we, we are going to assess bowel shifts. Uh, uh, bow, I'm going to say, I'm saying, I'm meshing the whole answer together. Let me assess assess bowel sounds every shift, um, but it's not going to be because I'm looking for complications of the urinary catheter. Um, again, that's another one where you have to make sure the whole answer is correct. Am I going to assess bowel sounds every shift? Yep. Yes. But does it have to do with the urinary catheter? No. Um, and then I am going to maintain that catheter at the below the level of the bladder. Um, but what I am going to need to do is regularly assess why they need this catheter. One of the best things I can do for a Foley catheter is get it taken out as soon as possible to prevent infection. So number six, a nurse is caring for a client with BPH, um, immediately following, following a TERP or a transurethral resection of the prostate, which assessment finding would warrant immediate intervention. So A is, oh, is that, oh see, there I go again. Let's try again. <laughs> um, so this is a question where it's telling me a couple things. It's telling me what they have. It's saying they have BPH, but it's also saying they just had a procedure. And the really key words there are immediately following. So this is telling me time. Anytime you see time in a question, you need to pay close attention. Is it early or late? Is it right after or at a later time? Like, you know, is it right after or is it sometime like way down the line? So like, you know, we really always want to know about where we're at. So they just like, I should assume they just got out. They just arrived on my unit. And I was saying, which assessment finding would warrant immediate intervention? So in other words, this is saying, which of these is going to kill them the quickest or which of these, if I don't intervene, could lead to a very, the most serious problem. So what this probably means too is that all of these may be abnormal and all of these may be somewhat scary, but which one is going to be most life or death? So the first one says client has occasional clots in their urinary catheter. Um, so a, a key word there um, that might kind of help to like tell me is this answer right or not is going to be occasional clots. Um, so I mean, I do need to know if clots are okay or not, but generally the word occasional is more gentle. It doesn't sound as serious. So I'm going to, I'm going to kind of put that one on the back burner. Um, the second one says client has 800 mLs intake and 400 mLs output this last hour. So that looks like their intake doesn't match their output. That sounds kind of bad because I know this patient's going to be getting irrigation through their bladder. And I think what's going in is supposed to come out. So I don't like that, but let me see if anything else is scarier. Um, client reported having mild bladder spasms. Well, it says mild. I know bladder spasms are expected. So, um, you know, I, I'm going to cross that one out because if it's something mild, it's probably not as serious as some of the others. And then it says client's urine is a pink tinged color. Well, that kind of makes me think about bleeding, but pink is definitely better than red. And I think they're going to have, because this is a really bloody procedure, I think they're going to have some bleeding. So C and D are both things that I'm going to expect that, you know, um, 
that, that are going to be um, expected for a patient postoperatively for this surgery. So I'm going to cross them out. So then I'm, I'm going back to occasional clots or the intake is greater than the output. So then I have to think about which one of these, if I don't you know, call the doctor or do something right away, do some more assessments, um, it could really lead to death. So having occasional clots um, does not sound as scary as literally what's going in is not coming out because that means they might be absorbing some of that irrigation fluid. So the correct answer here is going to be B, um, that it, um, that's where I would need to assess and intervene. And so um, a client that's had a TERP, um, if they're having frequent clots, especially they're, they're, uh, they can have clots the first day or two after surgery, but they should not be having frequent clots, a ton of clots. Um, and they also should not be having like hematuria or bright red urine because that can be a sign of um, hemorrhage. Um, and if they're having bladder spasms that are like frequent or very painful, <clears throat> I'm going to need to assess their um, patency of their catheter. Um, but none of these are like, I need to do something right now. Now, if they're taking in more than they're getting out. That can be a sign that maybe their ir um, the irrigation is getting abnormally absorbed or they could have a ruptured bladder or there could be something else going on. So I immediately need to intervene when it comes to intake greater than output for the surgery. All right, last but not least, a nurse is assessing a client with suspected BPH, which question would be most helpful to ask the client to determine if they are experiencing BPH. So, with a question like this, what we're going to be looking at, um, again, we're looking at most helpful, which means all of these might somewhat apply, but what's going to be most direct to help to get to the bottom of things? So the first one says, um, uh, and this is specifically for BPH. First one says, do you have to push or strain to start your stream? Well, I know that BPH is all about flow issues. So that sounds like that might be a good answer, but let's keep it on the back burner and keep going. So B says, how many times a day do you go to the bathroom? Well, I know this is a urinary problem. That sounds like a good question, but it also says what's most helpful. And so <clears throat> if I'm assessing for a specific urinary problem, asking how many times a day they go to the bathroom, is that specific to this? Is one of the symptoms of BPH that they have to go to the bathroom often throughout the day. And so maybe, but that also sounds like a urinary tract infection or um, other things like that. So it's not as specific. So my mind wants to kind of put it to the back burner. C says, do you ever see blood in the toilet with urination? Well, I don't think that they have bleeding with BPH. Um, it doesn't say that they've had a terp. And, you know, usually I think blood in the urine, I think urinary tract infection again. So a lot of times, like I said, a question like this, we're going to give you answer choices that are correct for similar disease processes or um, like, you know, other ones that you're learning about, but it's not going to be the best for this one. And then D, do you have a family history of benign prosthetic hyperplasia? Now, I mean, that's probably something I do want to know, but is it going to actually tell me whether they are experiencing BPH? Can I diagnose BPH off someone's family history? And I really can't. So the best answer here is going to be A, do you have to push or strain to start your stream? Because that's going to give me the best information overall um, to see if they're experiencing symptoms of BPH. So that is the last question. I hope that this helped. I will, uh, um, I, I definitely rambled a little bit and I stuttered a few times, but I think that's what y'all enjoy about me sometimes as well, because I'm a human being. <laughs> so, but I hope this, I'm um, starting a series of different videos like these with different practice questions. I hope these help and I'll catch you next time.